and welcome to Numeric's video blog. I'm your host, Jim Jockel. With me today, Satyam Controller, SVP of the Client Solutions Group at Numeric's. Hi, Satyam. Hi, Jim. How are you doing? Um, we're, term of the day, uh, post-election, is the fiscal cliff. Uh, the second most popular term popping up in the risk circles is the collateral crunch. And if we go back into July of uh, earlier this year, Basel II, Basel Committee and IOSCO came out with a real statement saying margin requirements for non-centrally cleared derivatives have been proposed to reduce systemic risk caused by, among other things, the buildup of uncollateralized exposures within the financial system. And the paper is contemplating that uh, margin is imposed uh, to all non-centrally cleared derivatives. However, we have a CSA in place in many, many cases. I think what I'd like to really focus on today is the CSA itself and almost an ABCs of CSAs. So, Satya, for the uh, audience, what does the CSA re represent? So, so the best way to look at CSAs um, is is uh, as an addendum to the main contract. So when you look, when you have an OTC contract, you have a bunch of terms that represent how the swap is going to behave, and this is just more terms that uh, were buried um, in the in the back office for all these years, uh, and they're just very 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 important now. Uh, another way to look at it is actually as a derivative. So the uh, any derivative is a set of contingent payments that, that take place depending on certain actions, and the CSA actually fits that definition. So it is, in fact, um, a very, very complicated uh, legal document that defines all these contingent payouts, and and um, and, and it sits, sits behind all these derivatives that people trade in. And and sp specifically, you know, in within the context of the recommendations. Um, what is it meant to manage? So uh, I think it's important to look at the CSA as something that allows uh, people to manage uh, credit uh, risk, uh, credit support annex, that, that's what CSA is. And therefore, uh, the primary stated objective is to be able to uh, manage credit risk, manage counterparty risk, and let institutions focus on the market uh, factors that underlie the specific derivative contract. So, so wh while I'm doing uh, my swap, uh, I can focus on, on the swap terms rather and not worry about uh, the credit of the counterparty. But, but what is often not, not fully understood is the CSA also uh, creates a lot of implications for liquidity risk. And uh, it's almost uh, a balance between credit risk and liquidity risk that institutions have to have to set. Uh, if you create a CSA that is uh, that is very safe from a counterparty risk perspective, uh, what you end up with is a CSA that puts a lot of liquidity risk constraints and then gives rise to liquidity risk. But now, like any derivative, right? So you categorize the CSA as a derivative in and of itself. Um, one of the terms we always hear about is the imperfect CSA, and I think a lot of that has to do with the embedded optionality within yeah. that. Well, give us a walkthrough. So, so if you look at the CSA terms inside of any CSA, uh, what you will see is terms that describe um, the threshold at which the amounts have to be transferred. So, if if my exposure is more than a certain limit, uh, and there are minimum transfer amounts that uh, that are described. And there is a closeout period uh, from when the when the uh, exposure uh, exposures are calculated. In addition, there are uh, a number of rating triggers and number of uh, uh, events that are embedded in the in the contract, and uh, also optionality in terms of uh, the currency that that you can choose to post collateral. Uh, there is also optionality in terms of whether you uh, post uh, cash collateral or different types of instruments that you can post. Uh, in some cases, you can post securities, uh, obviously with a haircut. So, so there are all these choices that you have to make, and that's, I think, uh, the optionality that's that's embedded inside of a CSA. And and to be honest, it's it's far more complicated than than uh, a typical derivative that, that you look at. So, talking about the complexity, right? So, only high-rated um, uh, high-rated securities are eligible for uh, to be utilized as collateral, or different cash, mm -hmm. um, or by different currencies. However, the the LIBOR scandal and and, and the, the the move between LIBOR and OIS uh, post two thousand eight has created 
um, a, a difference in the way the risk-free rate is actually being calculated. What is the impact on the banks themselves who are now have to go out and look for unsecured financing uh, in raising that collateral? Right, right. Uh, unsecured financing for the most part is, is dried up and, and what we see is, is secured uh, funding and, and, and the question therefore is where do institutions get all these uh, you know, high quality collateral that, that is required uh, as part of the, of the contracts. And also another issue that is closely related is, is rehypothecation or basically the ability to use collateral from party A um, for, for, for supporting the needs of, of party B or as collateral for another contract, another transaction. And that means that the same uh, dollar of cash or the same treasury bill can be utilized multiple times and serve as col collateral for multiple contracts. Now, that, uh, while that is helpful and, and favorable uh, simply because there isn't enough cash collateral in the market, uh, it also gives rise to its own set of risks because there are scenarios where an institution might default and in spite of having a very good collateral, it might have too many uh, obligations. Okay. Thank you, Satyam. Uh, we'll continue this uh, strain in another uh, couple other video blogs. I want to thank you, and uh, please join in the conversation. Follow us on Twitter at, at NX Analytics, um, as well as our blogs on numerics.com.